I'm going to go ahead and get started. So um, first off, uh, thank you all for, for joining us this Monday evening as we have our Sustainable Claremont Dialogue Series, our oldest program here. Um, and we have a really special one tonight, one that a lot of members of our community have been asking for, and there's been some confusion over. So we're really excited to be able to, you know, serve as that forum for the public to come together and talk about all things sustainability and, and get our questions answered. Um, as always, a couple really quick announcements before we get started. Um, first, as always, uh, just a, a ask for you all to go ahead and join our newsletter if you're not already on our newsletter. Um, that's the best way to keep on top of when our tree planting events are, when our um, <laughs> events are, um, and all of that jazz. Um, we try to just send one or two uh, emails per month during a normal schedule um, and not to clog your inboxes. Uh, my colleague Han is going to drop the link to that in the chat box, um, so please feel free to, to follow that link later. Uh, and second, uh, we just started our year-end appeal, our, our final fundraiser of this year, um, and you know we're we're trying to raise a very ambitious fifteen thousand dollars in this last month of the year to help us do things like have these dialogues and to plant more trees and to have our Earth Day celebration and all the stuff that we're we're trying to do in the community to make it a, a healthier, more sustainable, greener place to live. So. Um, just started the campaign. We're we're nearly uh, uh, twenty percent less than twenty percent of our way to our goal. Um, but if you if you enjoy our programs and you want to support them more, please consider um, making a gift. Um, and again, uh, my colleague Khan is going to go ahead and drop that link for um, the year end appeal in the chat box. Uh, we do also have a. A uh, special giveaway right now. So, if you become a monthly donor at the $10 level, um, we have tote bags, sustainable Claremont tote bags that we'll be offering you. Um, so, one other perk to throw your way. Um, okay, so uh, having said all of that, we can go ahead and get started. Uh, as I said, today we have a, a discussion with um, uh, Gina from the Clean Power Alliance. And a, a quick uh, background on Gina Gina serves as Director of Government Affairs for the CPA. Uh, she has a, over a decade of experience working on environmental and clean energy policy and government affairs. She comes to the Clean Power Alliance from Tesla, where she spent four years, including two at Solar City, working on advancing local policies related to solar, storage, electric vehicles, and electric vehicle infrastructure. Prior to that, she worked at Global Green USA, a nonprofit dedicated to clean energy and energy efficiency, with a particular focus on low income affordable housing. Uh, before that, she worked on ocean and open space advocacy for the Environment California, and she received her bachelor's in political and environmental studies from the University of Southern California. So we're very excited to have Gina here to speak with us. If you have any questions um, during the presentation, please hold them till the end or drop them in the chat box. Okay, Gina, I'm going to go ahead and throw it to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Stuart. And, and I was actually just going to ask if you wanted to take questions as they come or do it at the end. So thanks for that clarification. Um, I'm going to run through a little bit about uh, who CPA is, what we do, uh, how we're relevant in uh, your community, uh, and then uh, talk a little bit about rates, because I think there, there were some questions about that, and then really open it up uh, to, uh, to questions and to discussion. So I will jump right in and let me know if the slides are advancing on your end. You see CP, okay, great. All right. So, uh, you know, I, and let me let me just say to start, I, I assume that this is, uh, that the audience is gonna be a mixture of people who are probably more familiar with CPA and less familiar with CPA. So I'm going to just really start with like a basic overview of, of what CPA or Clean Power Alliance is. For some of you, this, this may be very obvious, and I, uh, I apologize if that's the case. Um, so in, its, in the most simple sense, Clean Power Alliance is the local uh, community-owned uh, clean energy provider that provides power to the vast majority of Claremont. And by that, I mean the residents, the businesses, and the uh, municipal agencies. Um, Oh, sorry, you know what? You can see, sorry, you see the map, right? It's showing up differently on my screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Clean Power Alliance uh, is the clean energy provider for unincorporated Los Angeles County, unincorporated Ventura County, 
and then 30 additional cities within those counties. And this is the map of the, the full territory. I'll also add that beginning in early 2023, we will have three new cities in this map. So that'll be Monrovia, Hermosa Beach, and then Santa Paula, which is in Ventura. Um, the way that uh, uh, community choice aggregators, which is what we are, and I'll explain that a little bit more on the next slide. The way that community choice aggregators like Clean Power Alliance work is that once a city decides that they want to uh, get power from the, the community choice aggregator, everyone in the community automatically receives power from them. If you don't want to get power from them and you want to just get power from the investor-owned utility, in our case, Edison, that's totally fine. Uh, but you would opt out then of Clean Power Alliance service rather than opting in to Clean Power Alliance service. Uh, because we are a public agency and because we're a government-run agency, uh, all of our meetings are open to the public. We have a board of directors that uh, has to vote on any big decision that we do, which is made up of one elected official from each of the communities that receives power from us. Um, so in Claremont, that is uh, uh, Council Member uh, Corey Kalakai. Um, and then we, uh, because we serve this, this vast territory that you'll see here, we're actually the largest community choice aggregator in the state of California. And I think, I think potentially actually in, in, um, in all of the U.S. Um, so we serve uh, a little over a million customer accounts. Um, it also makes us the third largest, uh, what's called load serving entity. So the third largest sort of power provider um, that trades within the California uh, energy imbalance market. Um, so what that really means uh, is that we, we provide enough power that we, um, uh, are, are, are somewhat significant in terms of ensuring reliability in the state, uh, having the impacts of our clean energy production uh, sort of mean something. And that's really exciting, especially because the reason that a lot of communities chose to join Clean Power Alliance is because they wanted to get more clean energy more quickly to their communities. And so the fact that we are so large means that we have a real impact in terms of the effects of that clean energy. And so you can see this last bullet, uh, the vast, not, not the vast, but the majority of our uh, cities at this point have chosen to receive 100% clean renewable energy from us, meaning that we now serve more customers with 100% clean energy than any other utility in the country. So that's, that's really exciting um, and pretty significant. So that's sort of who we are. Let me get into what a community choice aggregator is and how that actually works. Um, so back in, uh, I want to say 2001, 2002, there was, this was right after the energy crisis. A lot of people were very unhappy with the status quo. And there was a law that was passed in California that said uh, for customers that are served by an industrial utility, once again, in our case, that would be Southern California Edison. Uh, communities who don't want to just receive power from them can come together and purchase their own power, or they can join with other local governments and do that as, in an aggregated sense. So that's sort of where this model came from. Um, the way that it, that it sort of used to work before this bill was passed is that the investor-owned utility would be responsible for all parts of um, ensuring that a customer got power. So they would go out, they would buy the power, they would ensure the power got built, and then they would deliver that power to a customer. Under the Community Choice Aggregator or CCA model, those two functions are split. Uh, the entity that buys the power and signs the contracts and ensures that the clean energy is bought, that is CPA. We go out, we buy the power, we choose projects, our board votes on them, uh, we choose where they're located, we sign the long-term contracts. Edison then delivers the power across the power line. So their job now is to maintain the power lines, the transmission, the distribution. They also do the billing. Um, and then uh, you as the customer are able to sort of just get both of these services on the same bill you always got from Edison. If you look at your bill, you'll see that there are two uh, different charges on it. There's the charge for the... Um, the energy itself, which comes from us, and then the charge for the delivery of the energy, which comes from Edison. 
But importantly, the charge from CPA is not a new charge. It just replaces what used to be the charge from Edison. So it's not an added fee. It's just that the, the fee is coming from us instead of from Edison. Um, all right. So um, like, uh, you know, uh, as I was sort of saying before, one of the big reasons that communities choose to join a community choice aggregator is because they want more control over their power. Um, they want, it could be lower rates, they want to get to clean energy more quickly. And so because of that, because different communities have different priorities, we offer three different rates. Each of these rates provides more renewable clean energy than the Edison rates. So for lean power, which is the most affordable rate, um, customers get 40% uh, clean power. And uh, in general, that rate product is about 1% uh, cheaper than Edison's base rate. Uh, another option is the 50% clean power rate, which is about 50% clean power, and it's about the same cost as Edison's rate. And then there's 100% green power, which is 100% renewable energy, and uh, it's about, on general, in general, 3% higher than Edison's rate. Um, I'll say that, um, well, and actually, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this more, but as, as you probably know, Claremont recently switched to the 100% uh, green power rate the 100% clean energy rate. Uh, as a result of that, it's going to uh, reduce uh, 64.7 million pounds of greenhouse gas emissions annually, which is the result or the equivalent of taking about 6,310 cars off the road. All right, so just to give you a little bit of a sense, I mentioned that different communities choose different rates. These are the current rate products for all of our cities. You'll see that Claremont uh, Claremont just went into the 100% uh, green power rate. Um, the, the thing I should mention, though, is that what your community chooses is just the initial base. You as a customer, uh, whether it's residential or commercial, you can opt up at any time or opt down at any time. You can move between these rates or you can opt out entirely and go back to Edison for everything. Um, really what the what the CCA model does is it gives you the options, it gives you choice, whereas before you didn't have any choice, now you have all of these choices. So that's just a little bit about uh, sort of who we are, what CPA does. I want to just go a little bit more into rates because um, that has, I think that was a question that may have come up. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned before, all three of our rate products provide a, a superior value at competitive rates and more clean energy at competitive rates. Um, the other thing to note with having, having power come through CPA is that in addition to, um, to getting the, the same re reliable energy you've always had, with CPA, it's really an investment in your community because we are a nonprofit organization so all of the revenue goes back into local programs that benefit customers and into the communities that we serve, including Claremont, and create new jobs. So again, with an investor-owned utility, it's for profit, their shareholders. With us, all of the revenue just goes to create new programs. So I think I mentioned before, in general, we say that our three rates, our lean product rate is about 1% cheaper. Our clean product rate is about the same as Edison's rate. And then our 100% green rate is about 3% more expensive than Edison's base rate. I will say that beginning in January for a, for a couple month period, we're actually going to see a pretty dramatic savings for CPA customers. Um, because of a decrease in something called the power charge indifference adjustment, uh, which is on customer bills, it's basically uh, also known as an exit fee. Um, because that is going to be decreasing over the next couple of months, it means that for a short period of time, um, the 100% green rate is actually going to be 10% cheaper than Edison's rate. The clean rate will be 12%, 12.8% cheaper, and the lean rate will be 13.7% cheaper. Um, it's, you know, exciting news for the, the next couple of months. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll note that, that um, you know, Rates change all the time. They fluctuate. The en there's a, there's an energy market that all um, energy providers sort of have to bid into. So um, this is, um, you know, we expect that in the next couple of months, we'll go back to our usual differentials of, of zero to 3%. 
But um, I do want to note that because people will see on their bills in the next couple of months that the price of energy will be going down or the, or the, the amount on your bills will be going down. And this is the reason why. Um, okay, so I want to talk about the uh, default rate change since that just happened and you hopefully received a lot of postcards and information about it and it's not it's not new news. Um, but beginning in October, 100% of Claremont's power now comes from 100% renewable energy. Um, this, uh, this happened because the uh, city council voted uh, to, uh, in 2021, that they wanted to sort of switch their default rate to 100%. Um, and so we, we sort of ramped that up over a year, a year plus period to give uh, plenty of time for, for one, for us to go out and procure new clean energy in order to meet the new need, but also to be able to communicate this change. Um, so what that means, again, I mentioned before, because of this change, the impact is that it will reduce 64.7 million pounds of greenhouse gas emissions annually. Um, it has a pretty big impact. And, you know, one thing we like to say is from a city perspective, this is really the most significant change a city can make in terms of uh, taking real uh, impacts on climate change. Um, so we're, we're really excited that Claremont took this action um, and it's already gone into effect. Um, you, uh, you know, so I mentioned the 100% rate is about 3% more expensive than uh, Edison's base rate. So, you know, it's about $3 more for every $100 of electricity charges. Um, uh, low income customers who receive care, fare, or medical baseline rates will not see uh, an increase. So the way that uh, that works is that those customers get our 100% product at the clean power rate, meaning that they will still be paying what the sort of base rate is at Edison, but they'll still get the cleaner product. Um, anyone who is low income uh, and is not part of those rates, um, we have uh, customer service both through us and through Edison that is able to help enroll people on those low income rates. And then if you had previously taken action around your rate, so if you'd previously opted up or opted down or just left Clean Power Alliance in general, that change, uh, that, that your action uh, stays the same. So this change will not impact you at all. Uh, so this is just a little bit about, um, about sort of what, what, you, what you saw. So you should have received a postcard both in September and in October, letting you know that the change was about to happen and letting you know that it was that it had happened. Um, we sent postcards in both Spanish and Mandarin, depending on what language you had opted out for uh, other information that we sent you. So we had multiple languages going out. And there were clear instructions on the postcard about what to do if you didn't want this change to impact you. Again, this information is sort of here again, even though uh, the October uh, window has passed, you can always switch between CPA's rate plans and you can always opt out of our service at any time uh, by contacting CPA. Um, so there are, um, you know, there's sort of more, if that's something you're interested in, I have a contact at the end of the slide and you can reach out to one of our customer service agents and they can help you with that. But again, uh, you know, the, the key thing here is that this is this is something that you can change at any point, and it is not uh, something that you uh, have to do if it's not if if you don't want to. We do encourage people to opt down as opposed to opt out. Um, but uh, again, it's it's completely completely your choice. The good news is that we have seen so far that there have been very very. Uh, low numbers of people opting out, and there have been some people opting down, which means that people are getting the communication, they're getting the postcards, they're taking action to stay with Clean Power Alliance, even if they don't want to stay at the 100% rate. So it seems like uh, the communication has been pretty successful overall. And I think that that is mainly it. You know, we, we do have some great customer programs, but I think we were told for this presentation to focus a lot on sort of the rates and the default rate change. Um, but I'm happy to talk about our customer programs or anything else if, if folks are interested. I have a question. May I ask it? Hello? Fine, fine with me, Stuart. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. My name is Evangelos Valianatos. I live in Clermont. I have had solar panels for the last 11 years. And so, but I'm curious, you said that Clermont has 
solar power, or solar clean energy, where from? There are very few houses in Clermont that have solar panels. So where is this energy coming from? So that's a great question. So it's not rooftop solar. I'm talking about large scale uh, power procurement. So these are projects that are in the high desert. Uh, they're in Riverside, they're in San Bernardino. And these are sort of uh, 200 megawatt uh, projects that are oftentimes paired with battery storage um, in front of the meter projects that we go out, we sign long-term 15 year contracts for. Uh, the uh, projects get built for CPA, then they get delivered to the grid and become part of the imbalance market. So not rooftop solar, you're right. That's sort of a different model. But you know, that discourages people, let's say in my own neighborhood to put solar panels if they believe what you're just telling me, that they're getting clean energy which is yeah. the exact opposite of becoming sustainable and turning the way away from climate change. Each of us has to, to put solar panels on the roof of our house. That's so it seems, to me long -term, it seems to me long-term distance solar energy, it it's defeats the purpose of what we're supposed to do. And I, I uh, as I was saying, I didn't really talk about our programs, but you know, our, our view is that to completely to your point, we need to be doing uh, everything and all of the above in terms of getting more clean energy. So we need large scale solar projects, especially because not everyone can put solar on their roof. Some people live in apartments, some people don't have the right sun, maybe their roofs are too old, but we also need to be encouraging people who can to put solar on their roofs. So we have, um, we have, first of all, a net energy metering rate that we offer to our customers to ensure that they're able to get solar. We've gotten some questions in the past about um, the CPUC proceeding that's been going on about net energy metering. What's great about CPA is that as a community choice aggregator, we are able to set our own rates. So the rates that come out of the Public Utilities Commission don't, don't impact us for the most part, and we're able to maintain our own project, our, our own programs. We also have a par uh, partnership with a company called Energy Sage, which helps people navigate the rooftop solar process and compare various bids to understand which uh, solar company is right for them to be able to put solar on their roofs. Mm -hmm. So I think overall, um, you know, if there is confusion with folks thinking that they should not get rooftop solar because their energy is already clean and there's no point, um, then that's that's communication we can work on. But our goal is really to provide a baseline of clean energy while also encouraging people to take their own actions to keep doing what they can to be green. You know, what is disturbing to me, not about what you just said, but about Claremont in general, you know, it's the average price of a house in this city is over a million dollars. So it's not a question of money. People who own a house can afford 20 or $30,000 to put solar panels, but they don't including the colleges. Look at the gigantic space they have over their uh, buildings. None has solar power, I mean, solar panels. So to me, it defeats the purpose of even understanding that we are in a, an age of climate emergency. So what you're doing, maybe it's complementary to that, but it is it your economic interest to keep people as they are, to sell them imported, green energy or to convince them to put solar panels over the roof of their homes, including those of the colleges, churches, parking lots, and so on and so on. Yeah, I mean, we, we are not a rooftop solar company, so we're not going to be able to sort of go out and talk to people individually about getting solar on their roof. Um, you know, again, I think what we're doing is very complementary to rooftop solar. Um, and we support the efforts of people getting rooftop solar. Actually, one thing we are doing in Claremont that I think can help provide some visibility about rooftop solar is we're working with, um, you guys might, might know there is a, a site right across from City Hall, the Claremont Library. It's actually owned by LA County. Um, we're working with them to put a backup solar and storage um, a microgrid on their roof so that there'll be solar on the roof. It'll operate regularly during times of sunny skies. If there's an outage, if there is a emergency and the power goes off, 
that will be a space that people can congregate and be able to still have power, still charge their cell phones, you know, go to for critical services. And I think projects like that will help provide visibility about the need to both have clean energy, but also to have sort of battery storage and solar on, on rooftops. So, you know, I think you're making good points. We just, we're not a rooftop solar company, but there are many rooftop solar companies, I think, in the area that can speak to that better. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, finally, my last question. <laughs> How far are you from Clermont where you import your energy? So uh, the the vast majority of our projects are in, Cal well, almost all of our projects with the exception of one or two um, are in California and the majority of them are in Southern California. So we have projects in LA County. Uh, we have projects in uh, Riverside, San Bernardino, a lot in the high desert area since there's a lot of open space there. Um, but that... That is a big priority for us as a local government agency is to really keep it local. You know, there are some, some rules around uh, large scale uh, transmission lines in Los Angeles County that makes it difficult to do certain types of clean energy in LA County. Um, so we're a little bit limited there, but in Southern California in general, we've been able to do uh, have quite a lot of our projects there. Uh, finally, if you do a tour of what you're doing, I would be very interested to come and see what you're doing. So if you please do that, do that through the Sustainable Clermont. Maybe some of us would like to visit, take pictures and <laughs> ask questions, and then talk to the politicians. The politicians of Clermont are deep in sleep. They are sleeping. They're not doing a damn thing. I have been here for 13 years. Okay, yeah, Zagalos, I, I think we want to open it up to more questions. We have yeah, a, yeah, yeah. A I, I definitely appreciate it. I made my point. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, this is Freeman Allen. May I ask a question? That's great, Freeman. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I wondered how much power you get from solar. As I understand it, you have three major sources. There's wind power, there's hydropower, and there's solar power. Can you tell me how much you get from each? And I'd also like to know uh, if I could contribute by adding more solar panels, if I simply sell my excess back to Southern California Edison, does that help? So on the first question, uh, so yeah, you're right. The majority of our clean energy projects are from solar, wind, uh, we have some geothermal, uh, we have some small hydro, but I would say uh, the vast, vast majority is solar. I don't know the percentages or the, the megawatt numbers off the top of my head. Um, we have signed about, two th we've signed about 2,000 megawatts worth of clean energy projects and about 1,000 megawatts worth of battery storage. Um, I don't, again, know the exact breakdown of what how much solar is, but I can tell you it is the vast majority. And then you, your second question was about uh, selling power back uh, to Edison. I wondered if I generate more power than I use, uh, if there's some way I could contribute it to you. Oh, you know, it's funny. We just got another question about this um, because I think it's a model that uh, happens in other states where I want to say where that people have the option of having their excess be, um, well, so first of all, any power you don't use that you sell back, at least under net energy metering, yes, that's exactly what happens. You sell it back, it goes to the grid, and usually customers get compensated for that. I will say that we have heard recently about models, and it was floated to us to consider adopting a model where uh, customers are given the choice to either uh, bank that that credit uh, through net energy metering or to donate the credit to, let's say, low-income customers or through some other sort of fund. Uh, it's a really interesting idea. We don't have a program like that yet, but uh, it's something that we're, we're talking about internally. It seems to me if uh, you had a, a battery bank or a power bank where we could store excess energy, uh, it would be very convenient and uh, very economical for me. I uh, I would think that uh, right now, if I had excess energy, I would just 
have the option of selling it back to uh, Edison or uh, creating a power bank of my own, which I, which I really hesitate to do. Do you have, you, so you have rooftop solar currently? Well, I have a contract for solar panels and uh, I'm trying to decide whether or not it makes sense to uh, install a power bank, a battery bank, uh, or simply sell it back to Edison. Uh, I would certainly like to contribute to your project because I support it wholeheartedly. Yeah, so if if you are a CPA customer, then um, the the net energy metering rate that you would be on would actually be a rate through Clean Power Alliance rather than through Edison. Um, if you don't, if you, when you move forward with your solar project, if you don't have a battery that you buy with it, then any solar you don't use automatically would go back onto the grid. Um, so you sort of by default would be selling it back. If you did pair it with a battery system, then you'd be banking it and you could choose to discharge it at certain times based off of time of use, based off of when the energy is more expensive or cheaper, which is known as time of use rates. Um, or you could, uh, you know, sort of, you could just choose to not not put it in the battery and, and just again sell it back to Edison. Um, but I do I do think it's a really novel idea of is there a more creative way we can think about that? And so that's again something we're sort of thinking about now. I sure hope you can do that. I, I would like to contribute. That's great. I think Richard has been waiting, and then we've got Rob with his hand up after Richard. Great. Thanks, Stuart. Um, I, I just uh, wanted to comment on uh, Vagelos' uh, comments. That is, uh, I think you must keep in mind that about 30% of Claremonters are renting and maybe even renting one of those million dollar homes, uh, but they're not owning the house. So, you know, they can't really put solar panels on their roof. Others, a significant number of other owners, um, actually can't put enough solar on their roofs because of shading from big trees that they don't want to cut down because they're so good at, at keeping the their house cool in the in the summer and warm in the winter. Um, so you know there it's a complicated process here. But by being able, I happen to have solar on my on my roof, um, and I, I can't quite make my you know, house run on that amount of solar because we have significant shading uh, from large trees, which we don't want to cut down. Um, so I am so pleased to be able to go to CPA and just check that box and get 100% uh, renewable uh, to make up for what I can't get on my own roof. They're getting up other places. But what that the overall effect is that it speeds up our move as a community towards you know 100 renewable energy so much faster than it would if we had to wait for people to get another million dollars to put solar panels on their million dollar roof you know it's it's just uh, I, you know i don't see anything wrong with this and in terms of the colleges they're coming around uh harvey mudd college of all places uh, you would think they'd be leading, but we're finally beginning to get significant solar on, on the campuses. So hang in there. I just think that uh, CPA has come along at a time when I can hardly believe our luck that we were able to jump forward so fast into 100% energy as a community. Hallelujah. I, I do have one question for Gina, and Gina, you know, working in your environment, you probably hear uh, whether uh, CPA is anticipating having problems now that everybody wants and has signed up for 100% uh, solar, 100% power, uh, renewable power. Um, what are the prospects of, of running, you know, do we have enough people out there in business who are uh, beginning to establish solar sites uh, or is are we going to be sort of hard pressed to 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 purchase enough uh, renewable energy to supply the demand? Yeah, uh, great question. I mean, and, and that's actually why we waited. So the your your council voted in twenty twenty one, and we waited until October twenty twenty two to uh, switch to one hundred percent green for your city because 
we needed to line those clean energy projects up in time um, to be able to actually serve the load. So it is, um, you know, it is definitely something we consider. We have, you know, I think I mentioned three new communities that are going to be joining. They just voted within the past couple of months, and we're not going to be having them sign up until March 2024 for the same reason, that we need to actually go out and procure new load. Um, you know, I think the the there there is a challenge, not so much from communities within CPA service territory from opting up, but more due to just the state uh, renewable portfolio standard requirements that are uh, requiring all utilities, uh, entities that serve energy to uh, start getting 100% of their resources to be carbon free uh, by you know, 2035 and then 2045. Um, so that really is the, the challenge. And there is a big ramp up that the state is having to go through. Um, it's an ongoing topic in the legislature with the governor's office at the Public Utilities Commission. So it is a, a real challenge, but luckily, um, in terms of uh, CPA and uh, our community switching to 100% green, we've been very successful in that endeavor and have been, we have a really great procurement team with really deep experience that's been able to go out and sign new projects to meet the load. And Rob, I think you got your hand up. If yeah, you yes, thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, hi, Gina. Um, well, I'm I'm a hundred percent green CPA customer, um, so I'm I'm really thankful for your your service. I have a somewhat uh, technical question, and it's somewhat it's kind of actually related to the the previous gentleman's question. But um, the CPA does purchase uh, renewable energy credits, and I was wondering because this has been very difficult for me to determine is what percentage of those recs that you're purchasing are using carbon offsets purchases or are they all genuinely 100% firm you know solar panels in the desert uh um offsets or or credits so um that is a good question we do not purchase any uh bucket 3 recs which is what you're talking about so there's different types of renewable energy credits um, the the one that I think you're referring to is when you have um, you're you're purchasing the attribute, but uh, but it's not actually clean energy behind it, right? You're sort of like we do not purchase any bucket three reps, um, and we have no plans to in the future. Um, so zero percent. So, so, oh, okay. So so how how are you handling uh, uh, you know nighttime loads for for a million customers? <laughs> So we we do have uh, it's it's different than a rack. We do have um, you know in addition to our clean energy uh, and also let me back up and say I when it gets too technical I will have to to follow up with you you know and, and get that information from our technical team. But we um, you know some percentage of our power is um, so is considered unspecified power, which is something that all, I think, utilities that trade in CAISO buy some percentage of their power from unspecified power. Right, that's, but, but, that's but we know that that's mostly, at least half of that is gas. So yeah, it, it is different from Rex, um, but it's sort of just system-wide power that we purchase from uh, from CAISO. Okay, so how, and, and what percentage? And what percentage? So it's gonna be different for every uh, tier. So for uh, for the hundred percent green rate, uh, it's it's zero. For the clean rate, it's fifty percent, and for the lean rate, it's sixty percent. Oh, okay, okay. So it's zero for the so for the green, it is zero. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's that's. I mean, that's just what you're advertising. That's that's no. That's what you're saying. Fifty percent or forty percent. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so for the so sorry if I'm if maybe I don't want to belabor this, but but for the hundred percent green then, so for those people that are on it at at night, so you know South Pasadena and now and now Claremont and uh, lots of other cities that are hundred percent, do you have solid battery backup for all of those? Yeah, so this is where it gets tricky, and this is sort of just the way that the state um this is sort of how the when when the state um 
what, the, what what we mean, and this is sort of statewide for every load serving entity, what we mean when we say we're uh, serving 100% green or we're serving 50% green or, or any level is that we are buying enough clean energy to serve the number of customers that we have as 100% green customers with 100% renewable energy. It doesn't mean that we're serving them with 100% green energy or renewable energy at every hour of the day. It means that collectively and annually, that's the amount of clean energy that we've purchased on their behalf. So it is it is a little funky, like from a explanation okay. perspective. So it does not mean that at nighttime, like, you know, we obviously cannot control the electrons that are flowing through the grid at any time. So it just means that over the course of a year and, and how much we've procured overall accounts for that much load. But at nighttime, you know, when all of our batteries have been, or let's say at 9 p.m. at night or 9 p.m. on the hottest day of summer when all the batteries have been exhausted and the state turns on some sort of peaker, we can't guarantee that those electrons are not flowing to Claremont. So that's sort of how that works in terms of what it means to have 100% clean energy procured on behalf of your city. Yes, I understand that. Okay, th th thank you for that. Yeah. That's, that's good clarification. Okay, great. I see that Sorrel has her hand up, but just while we're on the, this topic um, that Rob brought up real quick, Gina, can you speak to like, is this a, is the nighttime load the real challenge for CCAs and you know all it's you know what and it's not I said nighttime but then I realized I think that the issue that a lot of load serving entities have right now is is those sort of the the peak hours the hot summer days at like the four to nine p.m. time which is why these new rates that the state has had everyone adopt time of use rates are really meant to change people's usage behavior so that they're not using as much power from four to nine p.m. because that is when it's really hard to be able to meet demand. Right, and that's when we saw those flex alerts back in September for yeah. two weeks straight. Or yeah, whatever. exactly. Right, right. Okay, great. Sorrel, looks like you got your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Gina. Thank you for sharing information with us. Um, I know you talked a little bit about solar and how that you know relates to um, to this, but a friend of mine who couldn't join us tonight wanted me to specifically ask: um, Is CPA a good choice for solar customers? So if you could just speak a little bit about um, your advice about that. that yeah, I, I assume you mean like a good financial choice for rooftop solar customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I think on the, uh, the the easiest way to say it is, so your your other option is Edison. Is she, she's in Claremont, I'm guessing? Yeah, she's in Claremont and she's part of CPA already. She's just wondering, I think she's just curious about it. I'm not even sure if she's going to get solar because or not because of this, but yeah. just kind of curious about that. Um, so right she now- even have solar already, I'm not sure, but just, so, I okay. know others are kind of curious too, so. So right now under our current rate, um, our, our payback uh, for the export rate is 10% higher than Edison's. So we have basically the same structure, but it's a 10% sweetener um, on the export rate. Um, with this new structure that Edison's going to be moving to, we're still, um, you know, again, the, the good thing with CPA is that our board sets our rates. We don't have to follow whatever rates the PUC comes out with. So they've come out with a new rate for, for all the IOUs. Um, we are probably going to do our own thing with net energy metering, but our goal in general is to uh, encourage rooftop solar, specifically encourage rooftop solar for low income communities and encourage rooftop solar in a way that uh, increases reliability for the grid, which usually means with some sort of storage pairing. So that is um, what we're going to be looking at when we create our own rate. But currently, as it stands, there is a, um, a, a bigger incentive, a, a bigger payback that you get um, being under CPA than, than the alternative with solar. Uh, this is Freeman Allen again. Uh, my impression was that you purchase a great deal of energy generated through wind and hydropower and less through solar. And uh, in those, there's not a, a, a specific time that the energy is generated. Uh, would you say that that's a reasonable assumption? 
you're you're right that for for well for wind actually there is uh still a time of day that it produces more so it produces more during the nighttime hours um but for like a uh, geothermal for example which we purchase it it's not it's not um time dependent but we actually purchase quite a lot of solar that's by far and away what we purchase the most of and that's just because that's what's available so when we put um uh, a request for offers out an rfo we make it um, resource neutral. We say we need clean energy to provide this much power. Um, and then we have every resource bid in and that's just what we get the most bids from is solar. And, and I take it you don't consider nuclear to be clean power. No, we don't. Our board voted against that. Thank you. I've got a quick question for you, Gina. We've talked a lot about pricing and sourcing and, and rates and, um uh, i wanted to focus in on like the community choice uh aspect of this too you just said the board voted on something and i know that i get an email every time there's a board meeting that you know we can all go sit in and, and watch <laughs> if we so chose um but i i was wondering how many um I, and i should have asked this prior to our presentation if you have a sense of how many people actually do choose to change their plan, if if you tend to see people opting up more or opting down or opting out, just what sort of like the general trend lines uh, in yeah. this hour, especially as you're growing and, and the communities that CPA is serving seem pretty diverse and, you know, across a, a fairly large um, geography. So if, I don't know if you have any uh, data in front of you or if you could just sort of speak to that generally, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to think if I have data off my head for all of CPA. So I would say for across all of our communities, our participation rates vary from about 85% of customers up to about like 99.9% .9 of customers, depending on the city. For Claremont, uh, the our latest report shows that uh, about nine, so 91.4% of uh, Claremont uh, customers that would be eligible are participating. So it's pretty, pretty high. Um, and about 97.1 have stuck with 100% green power. So, so far, and I'm, mind you, it's, it's, it's recently happened, but usually when we see changes, it's within the first couple of months of having the change to a new tier. So at this point, uh, we are seeing about 97.1% of active customers have 100% green power in Claremont. Great, thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, so you have your hand up. Do you have another question or were you just is that a latent hand? Okay. I was considering like doing like a happy reaction or something and I by mistake put the hand up, sorry. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Oh, sorry, I do have a stat overall. So overall, our participation rate is 93.1% across, if you average across all cities. Okay, great. So uh, I guess I have another question. Um, do you have any suggestions about what folks like us can do to facilitate uh, your power supply? Um, more solar panels, obviously, donating electricity. But do you have other thoughts about uh, how we might uh, help your efforts? Um. Well, I'll say, you know, one thing that uh, is, I think, really cool about CPA and, and other community choice aggregators is that because we are uh, community based, we listen to our community. So Stuart mentioned we have public board meetings. We also have a, a citizen um, advisory committee. So that is, you know, most of our decisions are made by our board, which is elected officials. We have uh, our board meet once a month. They also have subcommittees, but we also have this, this citizen or community advisory committee, which is made up of uh, just regular people from, um, so it's, it's 15 community members. They each represent like a region of our service territory. They also have regular monthly meetings where they uh, review a lot of our um, policies before they go to the board and they give feedback on us and then we often change our policies based off of their feedback 
it's a it's it's definitely a time commitment, but um, that is a great way to to actually really be involved and shape the direction of CPA, especially for engaged citizens such as yourself. So that's a, a something you can go on our website. You can apply to. I'm trying to think for Claremont if we have. I think we have our rep. Um, I don't think that rep is leaving anytime soon, but we do have a wait list that you could always apply to be on our advisory committee. So that's sort of like the most ambitious way. Um, we, uh, a lot of the time we are, when we're launching local programs, we'll come to communities and to city councils to talk about the programs. Um, so that's something that I can stay in touch with Stuart about in terms of when we're launching new programs, if there's, uh, oh, thank you for sending that around. Um, if there's opportunity to sort of give feedback on our programs before they launch. Um, and then I guess the other thing I'll say is we, we you know, let us know when there are opportunities for us to come educate folks about who we are and, and what we do. So, um, you know, we, we are in touch with, with Stuart, which is great. We also, if you guys have Earth Day events that you're holding or other community events, like we have a team of people that can come out um, Dahlia Gomez, who was going to be giving this presentation today and then had to, uh, to, had to do something different. Um, she is sort of like the rep for Claremont. She's great. Um, and so she is someone that you should get to know and uh, you should you should call out to if you're if you're ever having something for the community. Yeah, and I'll say that we've had like an amazing experience with CPA staff over the time that I've been here at, at Sustainable Claremont. Whenever we have a question or, you know, we're doing our research on, you know, advocating for more green energy. Um, every time we've reached out to you or Dahlia, it's been uh, immediate responses. And so if, if people in the community have questions, they could either send them to us and we could relay them or we could forward them um, to you, Gina or Dahlia or, or, you know, anyone else at the team over there. And thank um, you for the feedback. Yeah. And then Richard, you got your hand up. Oh, uh, yes. OK, uh, Gina, it, it just occurred to me. I mean, I think you're you're very well informed on in terms of the state. But I'm just thinking about what the CCA movement has done for California. Uh, I'm just wondering, what are other states doing? Are there similar sort of parallel movements? Um, you know, the, the legality of it, the details of legality probably change, but I'm just wondering if we're all alone or whether there are other states who have been following our lead, et cetera. Yeah, you know, California has a really unique model in terms of um, the way our market operates. Um, it It's, it's kind of apples to oranges to even, like, I think it would be, it's a little bit trickier than saying, could we expand uh, CCAs to other states? There are other states that have CCAs, but their models are so different um, that it's, it is, um, I think, hard to sort of try to expand that structure without delving into the unique models for each state. But I think one thing that we, California, does do on a continuous basis is we set goals, we make environmental movement, and then other states adopt it. So it might not be the CCA model, but I think it's really the um, the way we're able to push the limit with our goals around electric vehicles, our, our, our goals around uh, zero emission resources. That's the sort of thing where I think what we do in California, a lot of the times through CCAs, ends up creating national policy. It's not the CCAs itself, but it's sort of like what we're able to accomplish with uh, resiliency and with uh, clean energy that gets adopted by other states. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Gina. Yeah. Then Gina, I'm sorry, I have another one for you. Um, I, I was just wondering with the growing number of cities that are joining these CCAs, and I think there's a growing number of CCAs in general in California, do you, do you see this as a um, driving other utilities to increase the percentage of renewable um, power that they su supply their, you know, constituents. So is it uh, driving SCE to procure more or are they sort of um, uh, tethered to whatever, whatever, you know, policy the state of California requires them to follow? So how much is this like changing the demand of the market or is it at that scale yet where it can have that effect? Yeah, you know, it's, I, I think, um, well, I, <laughs> I think the state goals more than anything are probably what's what's going to be driving everyone to sort of to move up. Um, 
you're totally right. The CCA movement is growing. There was one estimate that came out a couple of years ago, and I don't, I'll say, I don't know how accurate it still is if it's changed, but I can't imagine it's changed that much. But there was an estimate by the CEC that said that by 2025, 80% of customers um, that are currently served by, that, are, that could be served by an investor owned utility will be served by a CCA. So 80% is pretty uh, aggressive overall. Um, I think what, I know what some folks, not necessarily in our territory, but in, in other parts of California are thinking is that, um, I think some, some investor-owned utilities are thinking maybe energy is not the business they want to be in anymore. All of, that, all of the business is going to the CCAs. Maybe they just want to focus on the lines and the wires. Again, not happening in, in our area as much, but um, I think that that... Um, that's sort of more the message that's being sent as opposed to, oh, we really need to make our, our procurement cleaner um, in, in part because um, I think it, it's sort of a train that it's hard to stop at this point. There, there clearly are communities that are interested in procuring their own power, and I'm not sure if that's going to stop anytime soon, not just from the clean energy perspective, but because of the local control, because of the ability to set their own rates, because of the ability to create programs that serve their customers. So I think even, even separate from the clean energy, there's a lot of appeal from local communities to do it. Great. If I could ask oh. another question. Um, my impression is that a good deal of the power that you purchase actually comes from out of state. Uh, for instance, wind, uh, and geothermal uh, and uh, uh, perhaps hydropower from dams outside of California. Uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, the way forward really is more solar power uh, and less reliance on out-of-state power if this effort is to expand into other states. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say for CPA, uh, some of our earlier projects were out of state. So we had an Arizona wind project. Um, we recently uh, went to the board with a project for geothermal that was also out of state. Again, because with geothermal, it sort of occurs where it occurs. You can't you can't move that anywhere. Um, but with the exception of, and I should have my chart up, I, with, with the exception of maybe three projects, our projects really are in California, which again is why they are so heavily solar, because that's what California has a lot of. Thank you. Great. And then Dick, did you have one last question to, to finish us off? Oh, you're muted. Oh, oh hand down. Okay. Um, Okay, well, uh, let me go ahead and, and wrap things up for us then. Um, Gina, thank you so much for stepping in and, and giving us this presentation and you know filling us in on, on uh, what's going on with the CPA. If, if anyone has any questions um, that we didn't get to. I have oh. a question. I'm trying to express myself. The state of California gave a billion dollars to keep a nuclear power plant open. What do we know about that and why? So I, I can't, you know, I can't uh, speak on behalf of the, the governor and the, the state, but uh, I think there was a, a real reliability concern, um, which is why they extended Diablo Canyon by five years. Um, it, you know, it was going to be 10 years and then the legislature changed it to a five-year extension. Um, the, again, I can't, I can't speak on behalf of the, the governor's office. It was, it was done in a very quick couple of week period, but um, I will say that the, from what we know, the goal is that it does not go beyond those five years and that everyone is procuring as much energy and reliability as quickly as they can to, to make sure that it doesn't go beyond that. But a billion dollars is a lot of money. It could support a lot of rooftops with solar power, right? Uh, a billion, yeah, I don't think that's the direction the state's going in terms of uh, uh, subsidizing rooftop solar, but theoretically it, it could. Yeah, it's awful, it seems to me. At the time that we have living a, a climate emergency, for somebody to spend a billion dollars to keep on a very hazardous technology alive, it defeats the purpose of everything else, it seems to me. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it, yeah. And Stuart, I saw you, I saw you click on. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that, Vagalos. I didn't see you uh, raising your hand earlier. That's okay. That's okay. Um, okay, so we're at eight o'clock. And so we're going to wrap things up. So Gina, again, big thank you for, for speaking with us tonight. And um, we'll have this recording online and on our website soon. And if anyone has any questions, please send them our way and we'll, we'll get them taken care of. Hope you all have a great rest of your evening and we'll see you uh, later. Thank you, thank everyone. Thank you so much, Stuart. Thank you, Bye. Gina. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.